You can also check us out at youtube.com slash Sacktown Sports. If you're there right now, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, help us build this brand to bring you even better coverage here in the Sacramento area. Joining us now on the Folsom Lake Honda hotline, Folsom Lake Honda, your one-stop Honda shop to talk some NBA from NBA radio and TV, Brian Geltzeiler. Brian, how are you this afternoon, man? I'm good, guys. How are we doing? Doing good. Uh, the, the story today in the NBA is somehow LeBron James after his post-game press conference yesterday. And I do want your thoughts on that, but I also don't want to sweep under the rug. Man, that is a really, really good Denver Nuggets team that we saw last night finish off that sweep. Well, listen, there's no doubt. First of all, LeBron deserves to be the story today. And it's okay that LeBron's the story today. <laughs> the dude at the age of 38, okay, came one assist away from a 40-point triple-double last night. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, while he was running on fumes in the fourth quarter, every possession he was on, either Jokic or Jamal Murray. It, he played an outstanding game. He was terrific. The Lakers didn't have enough talent to compete with Denver 1-7. through seven. That was the bottom line. For yes, sure. listen, AD was very good defensively on the help side. He was, I would say that Anthony Davis – was the best defensive player I've seen in this NBA playoffs this season, and I don't even think it was close. He was that good. LeBron was great last night. Listen, Reeves played well. They just didn't get enough from the other guys. And when you look at the contributions that guys like Michael Porter Jr. consistently made, Catavius Corwell, Pope, Bruce Brown, last night was a big Aaron Gordon night. And for as for as well as LeBron played and what he did, I didn't even think Gordon guarded him bad. They, they switched Gordon off him a lot to be able to get Gordon away from LeBron. So you look at those secondary guys, that's where the series was lost. I thought Darvin Ham did a very good job. And, and, you know, people getting on LeBron today saying, well, you know, he's making it about him by even bringing up the concept of retirement. You know, he's 38 years old. He's done. He's the all-time leading scorer in NBA history. He's one of the three best players ever to play the sport. He's done this for 20 years. You know what? Four championships later, he made eight straight NBA finals. If LeBron James wants to talk about retirement, he can talk about retirement anytime he wants. And and so it's okay that he was the story last night. It really is. The Nuggets are going to go on to the NBA Finals. We're not done talking about them. Uh, for a lot of casual fans, they've been a revelation. For people that follow the league like I do, they're not. I picked them to go to the final at the beginning of the season. I believe in their talent. I believe in their coach. I believe in their stars. Um, but they'll have their time to be the story. It's okay that LeBron is the big story today. Geltz, to me, Jokic proved that even though he didn't get the award, he's still really the true MVP in the NBA right now. How about you? Okay, so let me say this, because I, I'm a voter. I voted for Joel Embiid, and if I had to vote again, I would vote for Joel Embiid. And the reason is very simple. Jokic didn't play well the last quarter of the season. He kind of mailed it in a little bit defensively. The Nuggets didn't play great. They certainly slowed down. They had a nice big lead in the West, and they milked it and nursed it a little bit. But part of that was done so he could be who he is now. Mm -hmm. He coasted at the end of the year so he could get on the floor and be as awesome as he is is now. So I'll say this. I do believe Embiid was the MVP this year. I know there was a handful of voters that would have given it to Jokic but didn't want to because they didn't want to win three in a row, which is an absurd reason I ever heard in my life. Okay, I still believe even with those voters, Embiid still would have won it. But I think it's okay that we turn around and say, you know what, for right now, for this year – for this season and these playoffs, Nikola Jokic is the best player in the NBA. And, and I think he has that mantle without the MVP. Yeah. And I think all of that is okay. Like, I don't regret my vote. I, I was the right vote. It was voted for the right guy for MVP. If I had to do it all over again, again, I'd do it the same way. But I'm very comfortable saying that right now, Nikola Jokic is the best player in the NBA, has been the best player in the NBA this year. And, and listen, he very well may put you know he's got a finals appearance now that's going to be on that all-time great resume as you know and i will tell you this i guys i have bob ryan who's you know forgotten more basketball than any of us know and seen more basketball than any of us or forgotten more basketball than any of us have seen this guy bob ryan calls Jokic the best passing big man in the history of the sport and that includes bill walton the guy's about to put it through something historic here for us, I think Denver probably does win it all, and good for Nikola Jokic because he he couldn't happen to a better guy. I was touched last night watching him hug and kiss his brothers and the kids and the family. It, it's just he dude's a great teammate, a great story, and everything that's good about NBA basketball. You didn't pull a Mark Jackson and leave Jokic off your ballot completely, did you? No, he started. <laughs> I, 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 I felt bad for Mark. You know what happens? Like it's. It, it, the ballots come, 
and the drop down menus are a little bit confusing. Uh-huh. I can see how someone that doesn't work with them on a regular basis can make a mistake. Mark obviously didn't do it on purpose. The poor guy, they unloaded on him. I, you know, I mean, listen, it happens. And, and, I, and I get where the unloading comes in because we do have a major responsibility as voters. Guys' money is on the line here. You know, listen, I mean, let's face it, you know, Jalen Brown gets an extra, you know, $35 million over a five-year deal, and John Moran loses an extra $35 million over a five-year deal. They're not making all NBA. So what we do as voters matters. With that said, Mark Jackson's mistake didn't affect a dime for anybody anywhere. It wouldn't have mattered, so it's okay. I unloaded on him, but more for comedic effect than anything, Brian. Talking with Brian Gelsaler, host of NBA Radio and NBA I like, TV. I like that you own it. I like that you own it. <laughs> <laughs> do you think – let, let me, I, I do want to get your thoughts on the Eastern Conference Finals before we wrap up, but let me jump back to LeBron real quick. Do you think he he's actually considering retirement? There are theories that either and, – and why do you threw this out? Just the frustration of getting swept and him going to the podium – in an emotional moment, like you said, 38 going on 39 years old. These are thoughts that might cross somebody's mind and and more seriously cross your mind in that moment than others. There are others who believe that maybe this is him already starting to try to exercise some leverage on the Lakers of saying, Hey, you better make it worth it for me to come back next season with, with the way that you handle this off season. I'll say this. He's got leverage no matter what. He's he's got pulled with them. I actually think he left the court last night um, upset that they lost because he played his backside off. Guys had all but four seconds in the game, okay, and and couldn't have played harder. I think his foot's killing him. I mean, he's got a torn tendon in his foot that that he's got a he's now he didn't want to find out while he was playing if it healed right. He's going to find out now, and it very well may have not healed right. And I think he looks at the wear and tear on his body, and I think it, it's you know he's keenly aware of the fact that he can't do what he used to be able to do. As great as he is, he still does it. He just can't do the athletic things that he once did, which is normal for 38. And I think he wants to take some time and think, do I want to come back and go through the grind again? I actually think all of this was genuine and authentic with him. And by the way, if I have to give him a little bit of leverage as the Lakers, great. But I do think it's all genuine and, and authentic with him. And I listen, I, if, if you told me I had to tell you right now, I do think he's back. And I think he's back, and the way he applies the leverage is he finds a way for the Lakers to get Kyrie Irving. And I think that's the guy he wants there. That's the guy that'll take big shots. That's not him, and there was no one else there that really could do that. He's going to want Reeves back. He's going to want Hatcher Moore back. He's going to want Irving in that Russell spot. And I think he's going to want to give it one last run with this group. Brian, I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself here because this isn't over yet, but if Boston is not able to turn this around, they lose this game or the next game, how drastic would you expect the shakeup could be in Boston? I think it could be pretty drastic, and I think it would be an overreaction. Um, I think there's one really important thing that the Celtics have to do. I don't know that you rush to break up the most talented roster in a league that just went to this conference final again and has gone to, what, five in the last seven years? I or five in the last six years. I don't know, and, and you still have two core players that are 25 and 26 years old in Tatum and Brown, and, and I don't know that you rush to break that up. There's two reasons to break that up, and none of them equate for me. Number one, if you don't think those guys work together, and if at this time you don't think those two can work well together, I think you're nuts. I think they can. I think they really like each other, and I think it's a, it's a comfortable arrangement for the two of them. The other reason you break it up is because your ownership group doesn't want to necessarily have to foot the bill, and, and it's going to be expensive. You're going to be in the luxury tax, and, and this is not an ownership group that's comfortable in that category, they're not like Joe Lake up over in Golden State. They're not like Steve Bomber. You know, with Grasbeck and, and Steve Tyuka, they don't want to foot that bill every year. But listen, you want to have a title contender in Boston in this era of NBA basketball. Luxury tax is part of the deal. Get used to it. What I, I would do and what I think is the, is the change is I think you have to put a, a much more experienced head coach that knows how to win in the NBA with this group. I think Joe Missoula. He's in over his head. I think he's done a very, very poor job. I feel for him because I think he's been put in a spot to fail. And I've been very critical of Missoula on Twitter. I've been, I've been critical all over the radio and TV. Whenever I talk to anybody, I'm critical of Joe Missoula. And not because I think Joe Missoula is never going to be a good coach, because I think you have a 34-year-old guy who was never a head coach at any level. You give him no any kind of head coaching experience. His lead assistant left to take a college job in David Stoudemire midseason. They didn't replace Will Hardy on the staff. They didn't replace Missoula on the staff when, when, when they promoted him for Ime Yudoka. 
He's really been just dangling out there. There's no trust with him and his players. He doesn't have experience in dealing with the media. He's thrown his players under the bus so badly in talking to the media that he's lost them. There's no trust there at all. And I don't totally blame Missoula for it because I know what he's doing. This was Brad Stevens trying to reinvent the wheel. He likes the guy. He thinks he's very bright, very dynamic, and thought that he would grow into the job. Except for one thing, that what Will Hardy's doing in Utah is what you do. You grow into that job. You don't grow into a team that went to game six of the NBA Finals last year and is bringing back even a better roster. You don't do that. You have to bring somebody in that has done the job before. Listen, I know if I were the Celtics, I would get Frank Vogel in there. I think Frank Vogel is the perfect guy because you have really good defensive personnel. He's as good a defensive coach as there is. The offensive stuff will work itself out. If this team's getting stops, they'll find a way to get buckets. And Vogel can deal with the egos. He's dealt with it before. To me, he's the perfect choice for this team. I think you have to make that move. And to my understanding, I know Missoula was signed to a contract extension midseason. There's not a ton of guaranteed money attached to that. It wouldn't be a big deal for the Celtics to eat it. If you're going to pay all this money in luxury tax, Make sure you don't skimp on the sidelines and the head coach, because as we're seeing this time of year, that's a role that is vital this time of year in taking you where you want to go. That's Brian Geldseiler. Check him out on NBA Radio, NBA TV, on Twitter, at B Gelts NBA, and our guest for the last few minutes here on Cattles and Rami. Great stuff, Brian. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Brian. Always my pleasure, guys. You guys take care. We'll do it again soon.